I just want to express to you what a what an honor and a privilege it has been to share this week with you. Um, I was sharing with my wife earlier this morning as we had a chance to talk on the phone that the, the blessing that I have received from you uh, has been absolutely um, encouraging, strengthening, um, and just has been such a, a moment in my life to know that God is such a good and merciful and gracious God and loving and kind. And I've experienced all of those things of Him through you this week. So thank you very, very much. I have to confess that when we had to get the, the COVID test to fly home yesterday, there was a part of me secretly hoping that it would be positive and I'd have to stay here 14 more days or whatever it might be. And, uh, and so, uh, but we, I so appreciate uh, it, it was, it was, negative. <laughs> that's right. Got it back. It's negative. We're good. So, uh, that's a good point to bring up. So, uh, but, uh, it's thank you so very, very much for allowing me to share this time with you and for you sharing your lives with me. Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful experience you've given to me this week. Thank you from deep within my heart. Uh, I will be forever grateful. Um, you know, as we've been looking at uh, Ebenezer moments in your spiritual journey, we have looked at different ways that individuals characterize spiritual journey and what it looks like. And Henry Nouwen was one of those that, that I have turned to a couple of times already when he when we've stated that he believes that the spiritual life consists of a journey that is both a journey inward to the heart and a journey outward in community and mission. And that's very relevant for our, our time of study today. Now, it speaks of spiritual formation in terms of a movement from solitude to community toward a life of mission and ministry. Early in Dempsey talk about the three directions of spiritual formation, one being upward, which is love for God, Second being inward, which is love for one another. And third being outward, or love for our neighbors. Neil Cole describes these a little bit differently when he writes that relating to God, nurturing relationships, and apostolic mission is the very DNA of a follower of Jesus. We've looked at Ebenezer moments, and as we looked at First Samuel, we saw that the, the key phrase for us was, to this point, thus far to this point, God has been helpful to us. And so we know that that was a very important, very important moment in their lives, a place where a spiritual marker needed to be placed, not only as a reminder of how God had been helpful up to this point, but a, a, an encouragement of how as God leads us forward in this journey, he will continue to be faithful. And that we need that promise. We need that promise. The hymn writer of the song we've sung all week, Come Thou Found, as I shared with you earlier in the week on the train when he was at a point of, of having wandered away some from his faith in the words spoken to him, but streams of mercy are never ceasing. And isn't that the encouragement for us to continue to move forward in our own spiritual journey? having Ebenezer moments that remind us that God has been helpful to us to this point. And regardless of where he leads us forward in this journey, he will continue to prove himself faithful and helpful. As I've shared, Ebenezer moments have come to me in different times and in different ways. And sometimes it's through the voice of another follower of Christ. And then that often is followed by the stillness of his voice communicating with me. And that's what happened in this one that I want to share with you today. This particular Ebenezer moment occurred um, back in, in my office. We were hosting a, a particular missionary. Often, once a month, we host um, luncheons for retired missionaries in our office. It's a beautiful and wonderful and sweet time. I, I love it so much. And on this particular occasion, there was a a guest speaker that was presenting for us that day. And he spoke these words in his presentation that I'm sure probably most of us in this room have expressed ourselves because I'm, I'm standing in the room in the midst of missionaries who have answered God's call and have given their lives in complete abandonment to God's call. And I'm, that's, that's who this room is made up of today. 
And so you've probably expressed these words that that missionary shared with us that day. And he said something to this effect. I don't have it exactly quoted, but he said something to this effect. He said, I've given my life to Christ in a way that I am willing to go anywhere to anyone, anytime. Most of you expressed that same sentiment. That's why you're here today. Because you too have said, I'm willing to go anywhere to anyone at any time. These are words of absolute abandonment before God. God, my life is yours. I, I will go anywhere that you want me to go. I'll go to anyone that, that you lead me to. And I will go anytime you call. I too had expressed that unconditional commitment to God and in my life. And it really is, it's an unconditional commitment that we're making to God to answer and to fulfill the, the calling that he's placed upon our lives. And as he shared that with us that day, I, I was thinking about those very words in my own spiritual journey. After we finished the meeting, I, I walked back to my office and um, as I was preparing to move on into my next activity, is when the stillness of his voice came to me. He had spoken to me through the words of that fellow Christ follower, and now the stillness of his voice penetrated my heart once more, and I sensed that he was speaking to my spirit as he had done before. I sensed his word coming to me simply like this. Phil, you've stopped praying that prayer. Hmm. You know, you would think after all of these stories I've shared with you by now that I would learn how dangerous it is to engage in this dialogue with God. And that I probably should have said, thanks, God, and moved on, right? But I didn't. Hadn't learned my lesson. I'm a slow learner. And so I joined in this dialogue with God. And I said, but God, I, I, thought, I thought that I was where you wanted me. I thought that this calling in my life, I thought that where I am serving right now is where you want me. I, I remember praying, God, and answering your call to come into this role of ministry to which you've called me now. Is this not where you want me? I sense God saying, that's not what I said. You are currently where I want you. I just said that you've stopped praying the prayer. Again, slow learner, I continued the dialogue. <laughs> and I said, God, are you preparing me for something else? And it was like I heard God say, don't miss the point. Give yourself fully to this last call that you clearly heard. But always remain open to my call on your life. I stopped praying the prayer. And so this was an Ebenezer moment for me, a moment when I realized that the only answer that could be given to the question, where are you going, was that answer of complete abandonment. This week we've looked at some questions that are important to me in my spiritual journey. I, I go back to them often as reminders and clarifying Guide, guidance for me moving forward, but the questions are that we've looked at this week. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you? And today we conclude our week together with this important question. Where are you going? You see, the Ebenezer moment for me then clarified for me that there was only one satisfactory answer, and that was, God, I will go anywhere to anyone, anytime. And the only way that I can keep this answer before God, the only way that I can continue to keep that before him with any integrity at all is to remember what Ebenezer moments are about. They're moments when we come to that full realization that thus far the Lord has helped us. Thus far the Lord has helped us. I love to study Paul's missionary journeys in, in the New Testament. When I look at them, I, I, I always gain some different spiritual insights every time I look at one of his journeys. And, and one of them in particular gave me insight into my own spiritual formation journey, especially in this particular Ebenezer moment. And it's found in Acts chapter 20. And that's what we will look at today. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Now 
Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. As I think about that particular moment in relation to this Ebenezer moment in which God was speaking to me, I want to share with you some things that, that came to the front of my mind in relation to that question, where are you going? And the first one would be this. In that dialogue with God that day, He was like, you are where I want you. Stay faithful to that last call that you've heard from me. And so I want to share this with you today. That is one of the things that we can do when we're considering, well, God, where am I going? Is first and foremost, I want to encourage you, stay faithful where you are. One of my seminary professors, Dr. Al Faisal, used to give me that advice often when I would call him and dialogue with him about God's direction in my life. He would say, well, have you heard a new word from God? And I said, well, I don't know that I have. He said, then stay true to the last word you heard. And so I want to encourage you, stay faithful where you are. In the beginning verses of what we just shared, Paul would say this. He would say, you know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I share with you a couple of things, maybe a couple of words of encouragement or maybe challenge about staying faithful where you are? Stay faithful where you are with a confident humility. Paul said, this is how I served among you. I served among you with Humility. You know, it's important to understand that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not tearing yourself down. It's not demeaning yourself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. What that means for us is that we need to be understanding that we have a spirit of humility to where we consider the needs of others higher than our own. And Paul was talking about that in Romans 12, 3, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to, to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You see, confidence and humility in the calling of Christ on our life is very important as we seek to be faithful where we are. And, and basically what I want to say about this today in our culture for how we try to navigate this. Can I, can I get out on a limb here and say that confident humility seems to be diminishing in our culture today and I think even in our churches. There's a sense of arrogance. There's a sense of I'm right and you're wrong. And even if we just disagree, that means you're wrong. And pretty soon that means you're going to be my enemy. And that's where that lack of confident humility leads us. We can be very confident in the word of God. We can be very confident in his calling on our life, but we need to live it out with grace and humility. We live in a culture today to where we try to simply out scream the other person. If I can yell louder than you can, then, then I will prove that I'm right. 
And I think sometimes we just need to understand God's called me here. He's called me here to be faithful to the word of God. He's called me to this place. I'm confident in the word of God. I'm confident in his calling in my life. Therefore, I can be humility. I can have humility in the way that I consider others needs more highly than my own. I can also encourage you to live with a genuine compassion. He said, how I've served among you with humility and with tears. We need a renewed passion and a renewed compassion for those not in a relationship with Christ in his church. Paul would say in Romans 9, he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people. Those of my own race, the people of Israel. In Romans 10, he would say, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. It's so easy to become frustrated with people in our culture, isn't it? Those who are not acting, we, we dealt with this earlier, those who aren't acting the way we want them to, those whose behavior isn't the way we want it. And before you know it, we can become very frustrated. We can become very frustrated with the issues that we're facing in our culture today and the people who represent them. But can I suggest that what it would, call to, what it would mean for us to be faithful where we are is for us to move from that frustration and anger to a position of compassion and love. And if we could say with those same words, my heart's desire, I have anguish and sorrow over those who are not in a relationship with Jesus. I think to stay faithful where we are also means that we live with courageous faith. He would say, I've served you with humility, with tears, and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. We need to persevere, even through suffering, with faith and courage. We need to not shrink from declaring the truth that God's given us. We need to live in, in faithful obedience and follow God, even in the face of opposition that we face in this world. And sometimes, as we've already alluded, that opposition can come within the body of Christ. But we need to persevere through that suffering, persevere with obedience, persevere with faith. Paul would say, these words that have come back to me many, many times, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. These words, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Stay faithful where we are. With confident humility, genuine compassion, faithful courage, and intentional purpose. In verses 20 and 21, he would say this, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, 
testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He was faithful. He had a very intentional purpose for what God had called him to do there. To be faithful in teaching, whether that was in public, whether that was house to house, and to do so without prejudice or favoritism. Willing to go to those that others might shun or reject or just outright ignore or say that they're not worthy of receiving the gospel. Paul says, no, I'm going to all of them, declaring the whole gospel, the gospel of both truth and grace, the gospel of repentance and faith. In 1 Corinthians, Paul would write these words, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. There are a lot of competing narratives in our world today. Some of those competing narratives come under the banner of religious of religion. But can I share with you that what it means to have this intentional purpose is to remain faithful to what God has called us without prejudice or favoritism, standing firmly on the truth and the grace of the gospel, preaching repentance and faith. And these important words, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised on the third day. Let's not back off of that. But let's do it with truth. And with grace. Jim Elliott would say these words. And I love the way he, he phrased it. Wherever you are. Be all there. Be all there. Be all there with confident humility. With genuine compassion. With courageous faith. And with intentional purpose. The other thing that I learned from this particular moment in my life as I was thinking about the answer to his question, I stopped praying this, but that I was at that moment where it was. The other thing he said to me was, just stay faithful where you are, but stay open to go anywhere to anyone at any time. Stay open. In verse 22 and 23, Paul would write, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. That alone right there would be enough for me to say, I'm good where I am. (laughs) I'm good right here, God. But we need to stay open to go anywhere to anyone at any time. And as I said earlier today, I'm, I'm standing in a room filled with people who have said those very words and you have acted upon that promise. That's why you're here. To go where God calls you, even when you do not know what lies ahead of you in this changing world. And we do not know. What we do know is that it seems that wherever He leads us, it's going to be more difficult than it has been probably in our life to this point because of the changes in our culture. You know, it's no longer easy in the United States for people to just say, I'm a Christian, to identify as a as a Christian, because you know why? They're going to be challenged. To see if their true identity is going to emerge. So it's more difficult for us than perhaps at any other time in our life. Maybe not for you. Maybe you're at a place now and you've been through some difficulties before. But are you willing to say to God, I will go anywhere you lead me, even if you've already revealed to me that afflictions await me there? I'll still go. One of the pastors in our network, I love him, Joe Emmert, and he uh, and I were talking when early a few years ago when he was sensing where God might be leading him in the Knoxville area and we were driving around and talking about some different things. And we were talking about different church opportunities that were available. And uh, as I was talking to him, I, I was trying to sense him out a little bit. And I said, well, well Joe, that, that might not be a place that, that you would want to go. Maybe you would rather go here. And he looked at me and he said, 
I've already put my yes on the table. I said, what? He said, I've already put my yes on the table. I've already told God yes. So it's not a matter of where I want to go or where I'd rather go. It's a matter of where God tells me to go. My yes is already on the table. I thought, wow, I, <laughs> I like that. I, I want that. I don't know if I can get there, but I want that. Like to quote Jim Elliott again, he says, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. See, I was sitting there trying to figure out what would be best for Joe. And Joe had already said, look, my yes is on the table because he kind of knew this already. God's going to give the best to me if I just leave the choice to him. And my yes is on the table. Last thing I want to share with you in, in this regard to anywhere, anytime, anyone is this. If you will pray that prayer of abandonment, you also need to be willing not to come back. Paul said in verse 24, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I don't consider my life of any value. The only thing that's of value is to finish this journey. Elliot has spoken to me a lot about this particular time in my life, so I'll quote him two more times. Jim Elliot also said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jesus said it first. When he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And again, Elliot would say, when it comes time to die, make sure all you got to do is die. See, we have to stay faithful where we are. But we also have to be willing to go anywhere to anyone at any time. And when we put that commitment of abandonment before God, it's important for us to, us to understand that we need to be willing not to come back. I did have the chance to be on this beautiful campus about four years ago. And at that time, I shared a story that I want to share with you again today. It's the story of Doug Crutchley uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Doug became a, a pretty successful banker there, and he was a follower of Christ. And so most days on his lunch hour, he would kind of watch the people go by from his office window. Pretty soon he began to ask God in his prayer time, God, how, how can I make a difference in their lives? And God spoke to him and he said, well, pray for them as they walk by. And so Doug began to do that. He would take his lunch hour, he'd go over to his window and he'd watch the people walk by on the streets below and he'd begin to pray for them. That lasted for a season and then God spoke to him again and says, you know what I want you to do now? I want you to take your lunch and go down on the street and actually talk to them. So he made that adjustment. He made that adjustment and he began to take his lunch. He'd go down and he'd sit down on the street you know, on a bench and as people would come by, he'd strike up conversations with those who were willing and he began to have some gospel conversations with them. And that lasted for a season. And when God began to place on his heart the people who lived in the villages who had never heard the gospel, he says, now I want you to go there. I want you to go to these villages these people have never heard. These villages brought threats with, with that call. Threats that many times um, people's lives were persecuted and their very lives threatened. And on more than one occasion, Doug Crutchley's life was threatened. On more than one occasion, they would tie what, tie what is known as the necklace of fire around his neck. The necklace of fire would be 
soaked in a flammable liquid and they would wrap it around your neck and set it afire. And on more than one occasion, that necklace of fire was wrapped around his neck. God spared him in these moments. And so a friend of mine was having a conversation with Doug and he's, he looked at Doug and, and my friend asked Doug, he said, aren't you afraid to go into some of these places? And Doug Crushley responded, a man can go anywhere for God as long as he's willing not to come back. We need to stay faithful where we are. But we also need to be willing to pray and tell God we'll go anywhere to anyone at any time. And God spoke to my heart that day and said, you've stopped praying that prayer. But God, is this not where you want me? That's not what I said. Stay true to the last words you heard from me until I give you another one. I'm just simply saying you've stopped praying that you would be willing to go anywhere to anyone at any time. And I want you at that place of absolute abandonment before me. That's where I want you to stay. Completely abandoned to my call on your life. And then I realized that to do that, I have to be willing not to come back. So on that day, those two things came together for me and the words of my friend Joe and the words of God's Spirit speaking to me and, and the missionary and everything. And I just simply took a post-it note and I wrote the word yes and stuck it in my body. Say, God, my yes is on the table. I have to look at that often. In full confession, my knees get weak sometimes. And I have to remember, that yes means that I'm willing not to come back. Wherever He leads me, I'm willing to go, and I have to be willing not to come back. Can I tell you that that's hard? Can I tell you, just, can I just be real confessional and tell you why that's hard? I'm now living in the city where I grew up, and two of my children and three of my grandchildren are there. That's why it's hard. It's comfortable. I like it. And I like where God has called me. And my knees get weak sometimes when I think, God, at this stage of my life, would you call me to go anywhere to anyone at any time? God says, I might. Just keep praying. <laughs> and be willing to not come back if I do. You know the only way that I can pray that? The only way that I can pray that is to remember these words. Thus far, till now, the Lord has helped me. There's a video that I want you to see. It's a video about uh, it's a, a young Muslim girl and the journey that she had to travel, it's a short one, the journey she had to travel uh, to come and start her journey with Jesus Christ. It's set to the music by a group named Selah. And the title of it is, My Heart, My Hands, and My Voice. I want you to watch this. I was actually a really strong Muslim, really strong Muslim. Then all of a sudden, everything lost its meaning. I started to look for God. I asked my mom how she would react if I said that I became Christian. And she said, I would never ever forgive you. It's such a big decision for me. Everything was amazing in my life. I mean, I, I was healthy. I was going to the best university. I had many beautiful, amazing friends. My family was, was amazing. I was dancing, acting, singing. I was doing everything. I had money. I was, I was living a, such a wonderful life. But there was always something missing. Uh, I felt it when I was a Muslim. Then becoming, after becoming a Christian, um, I felt that I found that lost missing piece of the puzzle.
He said, come, anyone who wants must deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, no matter the cost, be my heart, my hands, my changed in my life. Even the way that I look at people changed. Now I look at them with love, with real love. One week after I became Christian, a friend of mine saw me and said, there's something that happened to you and it makes your eyes brighter. This young girl was told by her own family, we will never forgive you. But she was willing not to come back. She said, my life's changed. I now see people with love. And when people see me, they say, your eyes are brighter. She was willing not to come back. But someone else was willing to go to her and not be willing to come back. Is your yes on the table? In a moment, I want to give you a chance to make it so. And I, I need reminders. I need visible reminders. And there's some post-it notes up here on the table if you want to just write yes and put it somewhere to remind you that your yes is already on the table. Let me pray a prayer of blessing for you. We've looked at who we are. We've looked at 
why we're here. We looked at where we are and where we're going. So I offer this blessing to you today. When you wonder why God has you where you are, when you are content and comfortable with where you are, when you aren't sure where God is leading you next, remember that you are called to be His heart, His hands, His voice, anywhere, to anyone, at any time. So stay on the journey because to this point, till now, the Lord has helped us. things to close our session today and the first is I'm going to invite David to come back we reserved the hymn that we've sung all week long for this moment so I'd like us to stand as we sing um, the words that are now familiar if you've just now learned this hymn or maybe it's been a beloved hymn to you for decades um, we're going to sing it again here I raise my Ebenezer and uh, while we sing I'm going to invite you to come and we don't have a pen up here. It's not appropriate to do that right now, given the restrictions we've got, but we have post-it notes. If you want to come get a post-it note, or maybe for you, the post-it note, and you've yet to grab a bandana, because but those go together, don't they? <laughs> the bandana saying, I'm, as everybody's running out, I'm running in, which means my yes is on the table. Anywhere, anytime, to anyone. And you want to come while we sing, you just come and grab a note, and if you haven't grabbed a bandana yet, but today you think, you know, I'm ready, grab it. I want to remind you, these are not tokens. These are not souvenirs of our spiritual emphasis. This could be just a, just a concrete expression that you're laying a, your stone in the ground and saying, this moment I will remember because it shaped me, and I'm, I'm declaring to this point God has helped me, and it's going to propel me to what God has got in store for me next. So again, if you want to, why don't you stand? If you want to come grab a post-it note, it's just a simple post-it note. Come get it. Put it in your Bible. Put it somewhere you'll notice. And, and with your own pen, just write yes on it. And um, like Phil, let that be a constant reminder that your yes is on the table. David. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues upon it mount of thy redeeming love here I raise mine Ebenezer hither by thy help I'm come and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at Jesus on me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed his precious blood Oh to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering 
heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. I don't suppose um, a sticky note with yes on it is an easy decision. Uh, and I also don't suppose this is the only pad of sticky notes you have access to. As you're praying and processing through that, I, I think that is actually a good encouragement. To actually put something physically in your Bible that would just say every time you open it, God, yes. And the irony may be that when you say yes to anywhere, anytime, to anyone, it, it infuses meaning into where you're assigned right now. Like it just it adds a whole new dimension to where you're currently assigned as well. I'd love to end our session together uh, with praying for Phil as he prepares to leave. And I'm going to actually ask Don McNaughton. Um, you may not know the connection between Phil and Don. Uh, they were actually virtually introduced during the pandemic. Phil was asked to speak at Carson Newman. He was teaching during the spring semester last year, spiritual formation, Christian ministry. He asked, Rob, do you know anybody that has that kind of a syllabi? I, I reached out to Don and within minutes, Don had said, here's everything I've got, send it to Phil. And so it's just a delight to see these men actually per, in person brought together. So Don, would you mind praying as we close for Phil as he prepares to go back to his assignment in Knox County? Pray with me. Father, we have enjoyed Phil's ministry to us. There is something very personal about him. He offers himself genuinely. He's very approachable. He has the wisdom of years of listening and obeying behind him. And it's not just behind him, he carries it with him. And as he said to us today, it's in his future. He has planned to keep you in first place. He makes personal sacrifices to do that. Some we can guess at, some we heard hints about. Uh, he graciously keeps those to himself. But he makes them uh, in front of you. And that's part of what's on the table in his life. Father, I, I, we pray that you would uh, give him every grace to be healthy and enjoying his walk with you as he enjoys his family and all that you have given them. Uh, he is very careful not to let things that he enjoys interfere with how you want to talk to him and how you want to lead him. And he's been very honest with us again today that that doesn't just happen. That comes with a decision and a sacrifice attached. That comes with a fight, a struggle to keep it in first place in his life. Would you bless him for that? Uh, that's what uh, one of the things that, that blesses us because he can speak from that place in his life. He's doing it now and he's done it for years. 
Father, we long to have uh, his example in our lives. We long to have a long track record of commitment and service to you, of loving you, loving others. Would you continue to give him opportunity to praise his God and to ask others to join him? Would you bless him as he puts all uh, of his resources uh, on the table day after day ministering to churches and to other pastors, to leaders, uh, celebrating the reality of you in their lives and uh, taking on uh, in a straightforward fashion all of the challenges that come into their lives and believing and having confidence that there is uh, a blessed way, a godly way, your way, of moving in those challenges uh, to honor you and to strengthen other people. Father, he's up to all those things. Thank you for sharing him with us this week. We ask that you give him all of your protection, all of your grace, your kindness, your support uh, as he leaves and heads home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Those in the room, those joining us online, thank you for making this the priority of your week. Phil doesn't intend to take this material back with him, so we're just going to leave it here. And then um, I'm going to ask Mary to collect it and have it in student, student life office. Uh, one last piece of instruction. You're, you may be wondering about this evening and the, and the barbecue. The only restriction we've got is um, obviously you could come in if you need to use the restroom, but otherwise we are going to show up. We're not going to come through the building. It's going to show up outside down there by the games room, and we're just going to congregate down there. Uh, reminder, if you're from a student housing unit together, that you're a bubble. If you're a family, you're a bubble. And otherwise, we're just going to be very mindful to stay a distance apart from each other we can if 200 people show up we're all good we can do that we're just gonna have to do it out there and we're praying to God for great weather and we're gonna enjoy great fellowship I say all that in this session because Phil's gonna be joining us so if you if you're still going I could, I could just have a minute with him you can you know he's here and he'll be here tonight and might just sneak away somewhere on our bald hillside to have a conversation with you if you need it. So he'll be with us again. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you there, um, or I'll look forward to seeing you in the near future. God bless you. <laughs>